Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Bodhi Day and Year End Family Service uh, at Higashonganji. Um, as I said last week, it's hard to believe that uh, we've gone this many months without uh, seeing all of you here, and uh, we hope that uh, in the not too distant future we'll we'll be able to have some people gathering here at the temple again. Um, the other thing we normally do on family services is, you know, acknowledge birthdays. Uh, so people who are celebrating birthdays in the month of December. So happy birthday to, um, to all of you who are celebrating birthdays in the month of December. Um, so for now, we're going to go on with the service. So if you can all please rise if you'd like uh, for the Vandana Tisarana and the Three Treasures. And please remain standing for the singing of the Gatha, How Sweetly the Lotus Grows, on page 118.
Thank you. And uh, again, sorry for the uh, technical glitch there. I'm not sure exactly why that happened, but um, but anyways. Okay, so now we will have uh, sutra chanting. Uh, let's see, it'll be Tom Butsuget today since it's family service. So um, everybody, this is going to be Tom Butsuget.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I forgot to mention earlier, you know, I think um, we have a lot of um, USC and UCLA alum at, uh, at Higashonganji, and so I guess congrats to the, uh, to the Trojans and uh, a close loss for the Bruins, but uh, they seem to be getting better. So I, I think um, they can look forward to some brighter days because uh, they look a lot better now than they did uh, earlier in the year and definitely better than last season. So uh, go UCLA and go USC. Um, okay, so next we are gonna have a Dharma talk and we're very happy that uh, Reverend Fred Brennan, who most of you know, uh, is going to be delivering the Dharma talk for today's uh, service. So uh, here is Reverend Fred. Namu Amida Butsu, Namu Amida Butsu, Namu Amida Butsu. Thank you, friends, for being here today, this morning, at our Sunday morning service for the Betsuin. I'm Reverend Frederick Brennan. I'm uh, recording here from um, Yucaipa, California, which is about 70 miles east of, of um, Little Tokyo. And um, while there's a distance, we're able to communicate through this uh, technology of Zoom, which I think is quite a marvel. Anyway, today is a very, very special day. Uh, when you consider that in this season of festivities of so many holidays, that between November 1st and January 15th, there are 29 major holidays that are observed world, uh, worldwide. And uh, we have a day here uh, for ourselves, which is Bodhi Day. And that's what I'm here to uh, talk and share with you about. Um, let me ask you right off, why holidays? Why, why do we do this? Uh, the word holiday, of course, means a uh, uh, holy day. It was the, um, um, I think, Anglo-Saxon or, or early English form uh, for these kind of observances, obviously connected with religion, usually a feast or a celebration to commemorate uh, events that happened in various religious uh, traditions. Obviously, a uh, holy day is not unique to Christianity or to Judaism or Islam. It is a worldwide phenomena. Uh, Buddhism has its holy days or days that are set to recognize or to commemorate uh, events in the life of the Buddha. In our Jodo Shinshu tradition, we have events in the life of uh, our founder, Shinran Shonen. We uh, celebrate his birthday and commemorate um, his passing. Uh, recently, we just did our Honko service, and as was stated, uh, Honko is the ending and beginning of the Jodo Shinshu year. I think that's something to reflect on, but if, if we consider Honko where we express our gratitude to our teacher, this puts us in perspective to how the rest of the year follows. And right immediately after Honko, here in this country, we have our Thanksgiving Day uh, celebration where we express thanksgiving and gratitude, well, to each other, to our fa families and to our friends. This is, uh, I think, a very auspicious thing for us because the publicity of Honko to the privacy of Thanksgiving Day, where we express to each other, to our loved ones, and they express to ourselves. Uh, it's a unique thing to have, um, embarrassing thing for many of us to have people say thank you to us and everything, but that's part of the package of being interconnected. We thank each other and we express gratitude to each other. and We find things of worth to learn from each other. And now we come to Bodhi Day where we express our gratitude to the Buddha for the work of the Dharma that he discovered and brought forth for all the world to, to see and to learn. Um, I think one thing that's unique about a Buddhist holiday is that while in other religions, the focus is on the main figure and for something for, that you would learn from, I think the thing about Buddhist holidays is that they are really about us. They are set to teach us something about the truth of our existence and of our life and, as a, and given as a guide or a template for us to go forward. It's not enough just to honor the Buddha for waking up. 
if we really mean it, we need to wake up. Otherwise, what's the point? And everything, why are we why are we doing this? So I think we need to reflect on when we do holidays like Hanamatsuri and Bodhi Day, what is this day saying about us? How do we get, begin this great path of enlightenment that we uh, talk about in the beginning of our service with the uh, Vedana Tisarana and the uh, taking refuge in the three treasures? And so I think it would behoove us to um, look a little bit at the life of the Buddha in this um, matter of how it speaks to us. Now, I, I should tell you that when we listen to the stories of the life of the Buddha, they're not being presented as biography. Biography as we know it did not exist back then. Stories of people were fashioned, well, fashioned as stories. Um, when I first heard the story of the life of the Buddha, as a teenager, I recognized the form. It formed like a fairy tale. It's not to say that's false or anything else, but it takes on that drama where you have a hero who does not, uh, what we call the mythic journey or the hero or the heroine's journey where they go through various encounters to finally gain the prize or the reward that the end of the story promises. And so much of the story of the Buddha is been fashioned and presented us in this means, again, to bring home to us that this is our story. And so when we look at the story, we're presented, first of all, with Siddhartha at his birth. Uh, his father's, of course, very excited that he hears of, of the birth of his son and the soothsayers prophesy that he will either be a great religious teacher or a great world conqueror. Of course, his father wants him to be a great world conqueror because uh, that would bring honor to the family. Uh, it would extend the rulership of their family for generations uh, to come and everything. Uh, but in the tr triumph of Siddhartha's birth, there comes the tragedy of the death of his mother, uh, a thing that often happens uh, in childbirth up until recent time. That was a dangerous thing for women to do to go through and give birth. And so this was a blow to the king in the light of the promise of his son. And somewhere along the line, he felt the need to protect Siddhartha from the things of the world, perhaps to, to avoid the religious questioning, but that something had happened and that Siddhartha needed this kind of uh, protection. Honestly, if, um, if, if Siddhartha was meant to rule the world, why do we not hear of the great battles that Siddhartha went through as a child, like we hear of the stories of Alexander the Great? Why do we not hear stories of him being raised in the army barracks and learning the craft of uh, war? We don't hear that aspect. So something is going on in this. And I think the meaning of the story is that we often live our own lives with promise, and yet we go into seclusion. We um, to use uh, the metaphor from one of the Western religions, we hide our life under a bushel. Uh, our, our light is hid away. We're afraid to go forth. We hide ourselves from the truth of the truths of the world, and we hide ourselves from the truths of ourselves. And so this continues in his life as he goes from palace to palace, living the life of a playboy, a life of pleasure. Um, he's married off, and he. He has a son himself, uh, this will come later to the story, but he lives this sheltered life, not thinking or seeing what the real world is around him. Finally, he starts questioning and he asks the questions that affect his life. We also, as individuals and as a society, we have questions. I went through this growing up where I had questions about the nature of reality and of, 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 of people, you know, what's my, my mind, look at other, the other people have minds. These are ponderous questions for a little kid to think about, but kids think about uh, these kinds of things and wondering, you know, what are the answers? And are they, I think everybody goes to this where we question, who am I? Who are you? Why are you here? Why am I here? What's the meaning of my life, particularly in the face of, of old age, 
sickness, and death. What is the point of gaining all the riches of the world if the end is the grave? What is the purpose of all? What is the meaning of it all? And so Siddhartha comes to these questions and he needs to find answers. I felt the same needs myself, really very existential ones. What is the meaning and purpose of my life? Uh, is there relationship with others? Is, am I real? You know, we often have that saying from the 60s, you know, get real and everything. And that's something that I wanted very, very much because I felt very constricted by the life I was living growing up. And so Siddhartha leaves home on the beginning of his quest. He leaves his wife and newly born son. Uh, this is something to reflect on. In our society today, we would consider this a great... Um, lack of character on Siddhartha's part to desert one's uh, child or family, but yet he did this, he took this particular path. Siddhartha goes and he signs up with some of the leading teachers of his time who taught him such intense uh, meditational practices that reach heights, I can't even begin to describe the metaphysical levels uh, that he is supposed to have gone through. But the end of the matter was he was able to get to those heights. And yet when he comes back down into the real world, it was all nothing. The, it did not answer his basic questions. It just meant that he could rarefy his mind into virtual oblivion or whatever the state was. It did not satisfy. I think that's a very important thing for ourselves. We want answers that satisfy. We want solutions that meet the need. Uh, so he went through two different teachers and the same end result. So he leaves, he joins a group of ascetical people. And this was like the other logical, the other side of the extreme. Uh, he tried to get to the very heights of his mind, couldn't do it. This group said, well, the problem is your mind's attached to a body. So if you discipline your body, which is poisoning your mind, you may get somewhere. So he submits himself to these incredible, horrendous practices. He starved himself. He abused his body. Um, pictures that sh shown him look you know, almost like well, the, the skeletal f figures that you see from the concentration camps and everything. I mean, this is so unreal. Who, who would do this? But he did this because he wanted to get a solution to his problems. Finally, he got to a point where he realized that this path was now about to kill him. He pushed himself to such a physical level that he felt no any further he would die. Um, this shook him and he was on the brink of absolute catastrophe. All this effort, and he's going to drop dead momentarily. By, I don't know whether you would call this miraculous or chance or sheer luck, but a milkmaid comes by and they, she sees Siddhartha sitting under a tree, looking emaciated, but you know, in his meditative posture, and she sees something of holiness in him and she reverences him and offers, look from a Hindu point of view, considered him as a divine kind of being, offers him a bowl of milk. He takes that milk and drinks it, breaking his vow of making his body suffer. This saves his life. His ascetical friends, denounced him for throwing away the progress he had made for milk offered by a woman of all people. Remember, this is a very patriarchal society, but he accepts this act of compassion. I think this is crucial for appreciating Bodhi Day, but he considers what he went through. He went through all these extremes and maybe going to extremes is one of his problems, that he needs to walk a middle path or a middle way. Already now, the seeds of what we will know as Buddhism are now starting to form in, 
in his mind that playboy life, asceticism, this is not it. A life of moderation, a life of balance, of steering between opposites. Uh, this is a major key for him to wrestle with. The other aspect, which he does not describe, but it is so apparent that this act of compassion means something. Why did this happen? It saved him. This is an aspect of his life he did not consider. He grew up as a prince, as a playboy. Every wish he had was granted. Everybody fawned on him. Oh, what a great, wonderful kid Siddhartha is. The animals, the army, everybody loves him and everything. Uh, it must have inflated his ego something tremendously. And here he had wasted his life away. In the eyes of everybody, he was a nobody. He was just a sickly looking monk and this young girl saved his life. Uh, he probably never really experienced a moment of real compassion until right then and there. After he healed, recovered, and given the state of his um, body, this must have taken quite a long time, actually, but he got to a point where he was well enough now to continue. And he goes to this place called Bodag Bog Bogaya, and he sits underneath a tree um, to put it all together. What, what has happened to him? And he reflects on his life. And the process starts coming together as he puts the working, living a life of the middle way, the role of compassion. What was the, his life that brought him to this point? He engages in a form of meditation. You might think that he's doing a very highfalutin meditation. No, he is learning, he is practicing now a simple meditation that he learned as a young child. Uh, this was a moment in his childhood where he is with his father performing a springtime uh, fertility rite for the growth of the harvest and everything. And his father is plowing the field. There's a lot of euphemisms involved in this as you can uh, readily see. But for Siddhartha, he sees the earth being cut open. He sees a worms looking like intestines being cut open. I, I bring this up because there's a lot of belief by a lot of scholars that what may have killed his mother was he was being born, born premature and they had to do a C-section. His mother had to be cut open for him to survive and she would die of the infections and the, the surgery of this. So he undoubtedly knew from rumors or hearing things about his birth and that he was responsible for the death of his mother. This too is part of his psychological baggage that he never talked about, but it's part of his uh, makeup. That I think that formed a lot of his um, uh, religious quests and everything. So it's something again to consider. Uh, but in this process of this ritual, he starts to faint, he goes under a tree, he sits and he does this little technique of just Breathing in, breathing out, let it go, relax, and so on, get into this rhythm. And so he engages in this meditation technique, so simple, not staring at a wall or wrestling with a cone or anything, but just calm down, let it go. And so his life story starts to flow. And it is said that there are the first watch of the night as he's engaging in this, he sees not only his life, he sees what they would describe back then, uh, his past lives. I think, but we to look at the big numbers that they describe that, I think he was looking at the course of all human lives. If we're all interconnected, all our lives are part of each other's karma, part of each other's background. And so he sees the human condition. He sees how everyone is engaged in these questions, how everyone is struggling. And it all comes to the same end. How to get through this? 
But in the process, he begins to discover what you might call the laws of karma, of cause and effect, and reflecting on the importance of cause and effect. I think this is one of the, again, one of the unique gifts of Buddhism and an understanding of our own lives that we are all products of cause and effect. And it's what we wrestle against. Against. I think this is why a lot of our Western religions are very popular with a lot of people because of you know having a deity that could perform a miracle and break the bonds of cause and effect, but they are cannot be broken. We still have to go through, but we can change how we react to our causes, conditions, and effects. And this is the basis now of what will become Buddhist ethics, our intentions, our desire to change the course. Uh, that we are on and redirect causes, conditions, and effects. And in this process, as he's looking at cause and effect, he's looking within himself, how do I look at things? How, do, how does my mind put all this together? How have I been so misled all these years? And he discovers what are known as the 12 links of dependent co-origination, very complex topic deserving of another uh, Dharma talk, but he sees now the inner core of his own being. He's not looking outside on who to blame. The thing about cause and effect is all I have to do is find who started it all and mess it up. That's why in the West we get all hot and bothered about Adam and Eve and the s talking snake and the apple. It's, it's all their fault. So it's, it's the woman's fault. It's the snake's fault of everything, instead of looking at, no, it's my fault. I'm part of this of everything. And so he goes into this and he traces how his mind builds on one thing after another until he gets to the core problem of ignorance. We are all born ignorant. None of us come with a guidebook on how we're going to do our lives. We live our lives by what our parents, our society have formed together as collective knowledge of how to get through this life. But it often misses the mark too. We get through this life by being for ourselves against anyone who's different from us. Anyone who preaches a different answer, they're bad, ours is good. So he gets to the core that, no, we're, we're ignorant of our real situation. We're ignorant of everybody's uh, situation. And this is what needs to be looked at. As Siddhartha begins to see that perhaps his ignorance is why he's having all this problem. Why, in part, why he's formed the questions the way he has. He asks about old age, sickness, and death. And I'm gonna be honest with you, we cut out one of them. He, it's about birth, old age, sickness, and death. I remember he felt himself responsible for the death of his mother. So being born is a problem. Living is a problem. Dying is a problem. So why is he focused? Well, it because, it's because of his feelings of guilt, his feelings of inadequacy, his feeling of being part of the problem, the cause of the problems, and not any of the solutions. You can't find the solution until you look at the problem. And so he comes now to the truth of the, what will now form his mind as the Four Noble Truths. His problem is not old age, sickness, and death. The problem is his suffering or discomfort and everything else about this. Don't you have the same feelings of discomfort also about these things? We often avoid talking about these things uh, in our daily lives, in our services, and everything. But the Buddha said, no. We need to look at the problem. The problem is we're discomforted. And what is the cause of that discomfort? Not dear old dad, not mom for dying, not my society for raising me. The problem is what I call the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. I've often in jest said that the other religions have great theological swear words. Buddhism doesn't. But actually, we have the worst ones of all. Though you can't say, Buddha, damn you. That doesn't even go. It doesn't have any oomph. But the real swear words is me, 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 and mine, mine, mine. That is the sum total of our root problem. 
me, myself, and I, and he sees this now, that he is the cause of this problem. His fears for himself, not wanting to be hurt, being afraid, makes the end of life and all its matters a source of great comfort and the whole meaning of his life, a source of great discomfort that he is and has a hand in this discomfort, this suffering uh, that is plaguing him. He now sees what is the, the, the deepest root of the problem is what he has been ignorant of, what he is not able to see. Have you noticed that you do all your seeing with your eyes, but unless you're sitting in front of a camera right now, uh, I cannot see my eyes. My eyes cannot see themselves. I have to have a mirror or a camera here to see my eyes. But as a rule of thumb, eyes cannot look at themselves. Our self cannot look at ourself. But he was able to do that mind flip to see that it's me, it's him. And so the crux of the matter, is there a solution? Yes or no? This is it and then around him putting together living the middle path the role of compassion balancing his life the eightfold steps unfold right view right livelihood right action all these steps if living actually right is not the right word um uh, I, the word we want really reflects a wholeness, a balance, a balanced life, a full, a whole life, um, an integral life. Um, once my son in school, in grammar, in junior high, was involved in setting up their computer lab, and they asked him, "Do you have integrity?" He thought about it, talked with me about it. And since he had a math background, I told him integrity is the same as the word integer, a whole number. To be a person of integrity is to be a whole person. I think the Eightfold Noble Path is about being a whole person, not about being right or correct, but the life, the steps that bring wholeness. All this now comes together. It is now morning time. And just as the, uh, the dawning before the sun is rising, but the light of dawn is there, the morning star rises up over the horizon. He gazes at it and he wakes. He wakes up. He gets it. He sat there for many days after to reflect on what he had just gone through and what he thought. And he looked at his views every which way and everything just hang together. Finally, what to do? Does he stay there? He's happy now. He has his answers. He knows why he's had such a messed up life and he now has peace. He now has balance, he now has wholeness. It's interesting that in the process, while he was going through this meditation, that Mara, the tempter, was there to tempt him with dancing girls and with war. I like to think that Mara looked a bit like his father. I don't know if you ever watched the movie productions or um, play productions of Peter Pan. Captain Hook is played by uh, Wendy and her brother's father, the father and Captain Hook. I think. Perhaps he was experiencing his thoughts about his father in terms of Mara. He's lived this life of luxury, thus the dancing girls. He's being trained to take over and reign and make war. That's all, all, all this apparatus. He lets it go. This is not the path. He does not have to live the life his father wanted him to have. Now, as he's ready to put everything together on what he should do, the creator god of Hinduism appears to him and says, you need to bring this out to people. The gods are ready, the people are ready, but 
Siddhartha says, but this is a hard message. Look what I had to go through. But perhaps some just have a little dust. And I like to think that this is a recognition because we here in the West, we're concerned about the role of creator gods. But Buddha does not worship the creator god of Hinduism. But he hears and says, I need to put this all behind me. It's not that we need the gods, but the gods need us. Uh, we need each other. It's time to get up. And so he gets up and he leaves the forest. And when he leaves the forest, he runs into a Brahmin priest. And the Brahmin priest is stunned by the countenance of this bedraggled looking monk that just came out of the forest, but with a glow or a presence about him. And the, the priest says, are you a holy man? And Siddhartha says, no, I'm, I'm not, because he's put that all behind him. Are, are you one of the gods? I can imagine Siddhartha laughing. No, I put that all behind me. Well, what are you? And Siddhartha, I imagine, just paused and said, well, I'm awake. He's awake. This stuns the Brahmin priest and he thought, well, we'll see. Because the problem about being awake is, do you go back to sleep? I think we, a lot of us have these awake moments and then we go right back to sleep, but he stays awake. And the Sanskrit word for this wake is bud, for which we get the word Buddha, the one who is awake. This becomes his primary title uh, to us. The one among us who woke up and is staying awake. I think if you look at this story of, of Siddhartha, of the Buddha, I think you will see that this is also your story and my story. We have our questions, we have our struggles, we have those moments of compassion that have come into our lives. I think those are the key part of Siddhartha's experience that underlying all of, all of this as he's put together is compassion. And I think the experience of the milkmaid is what makes him get up. Because now, as he received the milk, milk of human kindness, if you like, that brought him to health before his experience here, he now is bringing to all of us the milk of Buddha kindness, the milk of compassion to wake not just us up, but to help us to wake others. And so I hope you will have a chance to reflect on Bodhi Day and remember that this is about you. It is about me. Buddha has done his job. His teachings has flowed out ever since. We may not have always understood it. We may not have practiced it very well, but it is still there. It is there in the lives of good friends and good teachers. It's here in our temples, in our, I will hesitate to say ministers, I'm not a great example for this, but our other ministers really, really are. It's there in all of you, all of you as a Sangha are a fountain of this compassion and the wisdom that is carried by this compassion. So I wish you all a happy Bodhi day. Take this day into your heart. Take this day as you celebrate the other great holidays that are happening around us. And when those holidays come to our end and we are into our regular days, carry them through anyway. Our task is to be awake every day. And in that way, every day truly is a holy day because it's a day of Dharma. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Namo Bhikkhu, Namo Bhikkhu, Take care, friends.
Thank you, Reverend Fred. You know, Reverend Fred's uh, talks are always very um, thought-provoking and sort of make you um, maybe look at yourself as well as look at life. And, uh, and so thank you to Reverend Fred for, for today's Dharma talk. Um, we will have a Japanese Dharma talk uh, following the announcements and Ondok-san too, so please stay tuned for that. Um, announcements, um, real quick, there aren't too many. Um, you know, there's no temple cleanup as we usually do uh, next week. So next week we will have a, another virtual service, so please uh, join us for that. And then on December 31st, our New Year's Eve service, our Joyaya service, uh, will be at 6 p.m. And so you'll be able to um, uh, watch that virtually. And then also on New Year's Day at 10 a.m., we'll have our Shushoya service, New Year's Day service. And uh, likewise, you'll be able to watch that virtually. Um, stay tuned for further announcements about um, the temple itself. You know, I think all of you know that uh, we're all being asked to sort of be safer at home and stay at home as much as possible. And so the temple will continue to be closed uh, for a little while longer. Um, but hopefully um, there will be some good news uh, coming fairly soon. Uh, at least the vaccine is coming uh, soon, so that's a good thing. Uh, any other announcements? Okay. Then uh, we will um, have uh, the singing of Ondoksan 2 on um, page 54. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we will have our Japanese Dharma message. Uh, Reverend Fuji will be taking care of that. So, Reverend Fuji.皆さんおはようございます。え、本日もロサンゼルス別院え日曜礼拝にご参加くださいまして、ありがとうございます。え、まだまだえ、寒い日は続きますが、え、皆さんいかがお過ごしでしょうか。え、本日は単二章の五条
あらゆることは皆ことごとく空ごとでありたわごとでありましてまことではありませんただ念仏だけは変わることなきことで変わるなきまことでありますまも,もう一回読みますね、えー、私はいいも悪いもどちらも全く知りませんなぜなら阿弥陀様がいい悪いと思われるほどに知り尽くしたのならいい悪いの判断ができると言えるのでしょうけれども私はあらゆる煩悩をことごとく持っている凡夫でありこの世界はたちまちに変化してしばらくも同じ形を保たない無常の世界でありますあらゆることは皆ことごとく空ごとでありたわごとでありましてまことではありませんただ念仏だけは変わることなきまことでありますこれが「歎異抄五条」の一部の現代語訳ですで英語の方もちょっと読ませていただきます In reality, all of us, including myself, talk only about what is good and evil without realizing the Tathagata's benevolence. According to the Master, he said, I do not know what the two good and evil really mean. I could say that I know what good is if I knew good as thoroughly and completely as the Tathagata. And I could say I know what evil is. If I knew evil as sorry and completely as the Tathagata. But in this foolish being, filled with blind passion, living in this impermanent world of burning house, all things are empty and vain, therefore untrue. Only the n e m b u t s u is true, real, and sincere. えっと、まあ、これが単二章五条の一部ですね、えーまあ、私たちは普段生活をしていて、えーまあ、いろんな選択をするわけですねこれはいいこれは悪いっていうふうに、えー、決めて、えー、生活をしているわけです朝ごはんもこれが食べたいこれはこれは食べたいから、えー、これを食べるこれは食べたくないから食べないとかあとまあこの人はいい人だから話を聞こうこの人は悪い人だから話を聞かないとか、えー、何ですかねこの会社は環境にいいことをしてるから、まあ、いい会社だとかそうじゃないから悪い会社とか、まあ、いろんないい悪いっていうことを、えー、自分自身で判断して生活してると思いますで、えー、仏教の教えっていうのは、えーまあ、勘違いしてしまうのがそういういい悪いっていうことの判断を教えてくれるものが仏教の教えだっていうふうに、えー、勘違いしてしまうことがあると思うんですけども、えー、そうではないと思います、えー、本当に仏教の教えが私たちに教えようとしてるっていうことは、えー、私たち人間っていうものがいいもの悪いものっていうことを判断することはできないっていうことを教えようとしているくれてるんだと思いますなぜならまあ先ほどの「えー、谷章五条」の中にもありましたように、えー、凡夫であるっていうふうにあらゆる煩悩っていうものを兼ね備えた存在っていうのが、えー、私たちであるからそういった煩悩を持った人間が正しい判断いい悪いっていうことをできることは、えー、決してないということだと思います。ですから、まあ、そういういいい悪いの判断ができないそういうのが本当の姿なんだっていうことを教えてくださるのが、えー、まあ阿弥陀さんであったり念仏であったり、えー、仏教の教えなんだと思いますですからもしまあもちろんそういうふうに煩悩があるからダメなんだっていうことではなくて、えー、煩悩があるっていうことを知っているのと煩悩があるっていうのを知らないで生活しているのでは全く違うことであってこの仏教の教えに触れて煩悩からまあ一時離れることもあるかもしれませんけどまあ基本的には煩悩を持った存在だということを知っていることによって普段自分中心で考えてた生き方から世界があって自分がその中にいるんだっていうふうな考え方の転換っていうか変えるっていうことができるんだと思います。ではまあ、念仏とか仏教の教えとか
っていうのはどういうものなのかとか、えー、念仏を聞いたらどういうふうになるのかっていう疑問もまた出てくるとは思うんですけどもここで、えー、もう一つちょっと、えー、朝原彩一さんという、えー、お坊さんではないんですけどもモントさんの方で、えー、こういった詩を残された方がいらっしゃいますのでそれを少し紹介したいと思います。目が変わる世が変わるここが極楽に変わる嬉しや南無阿弥陀仏もう一度言いますね目が変わる世が変わるここが極楽に変わる嬉しや南無阿弥陀仏っていうふうに言ってます目が変わるっていうのは多分仏教の教えを聞いて念仏の教えを聞いて自分の考え方が変わるそうしたら周りの景色っていうのも変わってくると思いますそうすると目が変わったら世の中が変わるそしてまあここでは極楽に変わるっていう今書いてますけどもまあそういう世界が少し違って見えるっていうことをおっしゃってますまあこれが念仏をの教えまあ仏教の教えっていうのを聞いてきた方がまあおっしゃってるようなことですでもう一つ紹介しますえオラのカカアの寝姿見れば地獄の鬼にそのまんまうちには鬼が2匹おる女鬼に男鬼あさましやあさましやナムアミダブツナムアミダブツもう一度言いますオラのカカアの寝姿見れば地獄の鬼にそのまんまうちには鬼が2匹おる女鬼に男鬼あさましやあさましやナムアミダブツナムアミダブツっていう,ふうに書かれてます、まあだからこの話では奥さんがこう寝てるのを見てきっと口か何か開けたまま寝てたんでしょうねそれを見てあの鬼のようだなっていうふうにあのこの方が思ったんですけどもそこだけで終わってるんじゃなくてえうちには鬼が2匹いるっていう女鬼はまあ奥さんで男鬼が自分だっていうふうに言ってます。それに対してまあ浅ましや浅ましやまあ、だから自分の奥さんに対して鬼だって思ってしまうそういう自分もそういう心を持ってるっていうことがまあ浅ましいことであるそしてまあこういう考え方、えー、目の、えー、見方っていうか世の中の見方っていうそういう、まあ、ものをいただいたっていう阿弥陀様であったり仏教の教えに対してまあ、感謝の気持ちで「こう南無阿弥陀仏」「南無阿弥陀仏」っていうふうに、えー、書かれてるんだと思いますですからまあ仏教の教えっていうのを聞いていくことによって確かにこう自分っていうのはいい判断悪い判断っていうのを自分の好き嫌いでしてしまうっていうそういう都合のいいように何でも決めてしまうっていう、まあ、そういう部分が人間にはあるそういうところは良くないっていうふうにあのまあ、教えてくれるものだっていうことなんですけども、まあ、必ずしもまあ自分がダメなんだっていうことではなくてそういうことを知った上で行える行動によっては、えー、この世界が、えー、いいものに感じたり、まあ、充実した人生を送っていけるっていうことなんだと思いますですから、まあまあ、こういう念仏を唱えるだったりとか仏教の教えを聞いていくっていうことの一つの働きとしてはそういう世界を見る目が変わる考え方が変わるっていうことが仏教の教えを聞き続けていくことの、まあ、一つの、まあ、いい点なのかなというふうには思います、えーまあ、これで本日の、えー、法話を終わりたいと思いますありがとうございましたありがとうございました。
all of us are sort of, you know, um, facing some challenging times, but any support you can provide the temple is uh, appreciated, as well as continuing to support, um, you know, the little Tokyo businesses and also the small businesses maybe in your, in your area. So, uh, you know, everybody's uh, facing some challenges and uh, we all pull together, um, you know, hopefully there'll, there'll be brighter things coming soon. So thank you very much for, uh, for watching today's service. Um, stay tuned and um, watch again next week. We'll be back next week. And uh, so stay safe, be well, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.